study of the pastoral epistles. We thank you that you have given such wisdom to your apostle Paul and such willingness to serve on the part of men like Timothy and Titus and make each one of us also Timothys and Titus who are always ready to uh, serve you in accordance with the gifts that you have given to us. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, this is, uh, that's, that's not, I don't think that's the right one. That's Second Timothy. It needs to be Titus. Okay, sorry, to, sorry for that. Andy to, all of a sudden had double duty, so he's trying to set up because they're having services downstairs, uh, outside, and he's trying to set that up and do this. So, so we'll get started. Uh, we'll get started and as soon as we we have it up. Then we'll do that. I have uh, here. If anybody is interested in helping with Sunday treats, I'm going to pass this list around. I'm, I'm going to just start on the row here, and uh, when it gets way back back there, then you can maybe move it over there and come up to the front. Okay, so if anybody is willing to help with uh, Sunday street, street starting next week, there's a couple, a couple of times that are set, but not too much yet. All right, we are on Titus. Uh, I, I'm calling this, uh, I, I'm calling, oh, he's got it up there. Thank you, Andy. I'm, I'm calling this uh, tidbits from Titus because we're not going to be doing all of Titus. Titus is uh, three chapters, three chapters long, and I don't have quite that much time. And uh, so uh, next week we're just going to do a preview of Revelation, and then uh, we we will be starting a Wednesday study of the book of Revelation. Uh, starting on, and it'll be announced too, but uh, the week after Labor Day, the 14th of September, so not the week of Labor Day, but the 14th of September, and we're going to go back in the class so that we have, we'll have a morning class rather than that 2 o'clock class, 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock in the morning, and then 7 o'clock at night. So two different classes, 10 and 7, identical classes on 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 Wednesdays and right as of right now we'll assemble here and but we'll see eventually they're going to try to get that multi-purpose room uh, set up so it can be like for Bible uh, Bible class and but right now just plan on here unless you hear something else and then also um, and and, uh, and it'll be announced this is uh, I'll mention it next week too uh, they uh, will have it set up in such a way that the um, Gates will be open for the 10 o'clock so you can come and park. And when you do, don't come way up here over to the, where the basketball courts are and don't park up against the school, but come up and park anywhere up against that fence over there. Is that right, Becky? Okay, if you park, park over in that area, okay? And then... Uh, that if you if you feel it's a little bit hard for you to walk that whole way. All right. So with that, I want to read a whole page almost with you because it's going to lead you into Titus. All right. If you look at that, Titus is one of the three pastoral epistles. It was written either shortly before or shortly after First Timothy, during the time between Paul's first imprisonment and his final imprisonment in Rome somewhere between 64 and 67 A.D. Nero died uh, in 68 A.D. And uh, Paul almost certainly was martyred under Nero. So that tells us that it was about that time. Um, and uh, the next paragraph, Titus was one of Paul's trusted and probably young also companions, a Gentile by birth. He's not mentioned in Acts at all but his name appears 13 times in other New Testament books. In 2 Corinthians, Paul calls Titus my partner and co-worker. Paul always valued workers alongside of him to work with him. And uh, Paul's confidence in Titus was shown in the kind of work he entrusted to him. I'm giving you three examples. 
he had sent him to Corinth as his spokesman, a, a difficult assignment since Corinth was Paul's problem child congregation and he let send Titus to try to do something there. And then next thing, as he had done with Timothy in Ephesus, Paul had put Titus in charge of several congregations on the island of Crete while Paul moved on to another place. And it was while Titus was serving in Crete that Paul wrote the pastoral letter bearing the name of Titus. So if you look at the, look at the map, you can see where the island of Crete is. It's a very ancient civilization there, uh, there in, in Crete. And it sort of forms the bottom boundary of the Aegean Sea. This is Crete right here. And, uh, and this, is, this is where Titus served under Paul. Over here is Ephesus where Timothy was. And these two letters were, were written in pretty close proximity to each other. Um, then the next one, sometime later during Paul's second in prison in Rome, he sent Titus from Rome to Dalmatia. Um, and that's, this shows the, 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 the little bit bigger map here. Here's again, again the island of, of Crete right here. That's when Paul took his sea voyage to Rome. But Rome, Rome was over here, he was with Paul, and Dalmatia is over in this area of Macedonia. So that was a third mission on the, part, on the part of Titus. Next paragraph. Though not identical, the letters of 1 Timothy and Titus are similar in content. For example, in this brief three-chapter letter of Titus, Paul gives, number one, number one, a list of spiritual qualifications for congregational leaders, just like he did in, in Timothy, okay? Um, and then he tells Titus to silence false teachers. And he told Timothy to do the same thing. Uh, especially, he says, those of the circumcision group, so Jewish teachers, who were, he says, disrupting whole households by teaching things they ought not to teach and that for the sake of dishonest gain. And remember First Timothy, the love of money and the, and the greed, and so there's that same thing down in the island of Crete. And then the third thing, and in chapter 2, 1 to 10, he instructs Titus on how to work with different groups of people in the congregations, the older men and uh, older women and the uh, younger men and the younger women and, then, uh, and the slaves. The one addition, and we're not going into that here, the one addition was how Paul te tells Timothy, uh, teach the older women so that the older women can then teach the younger women. Okay, so that they would learn from the learn from the older women. All right, then the th last paragraph. In our study today, we'll look at three brief sections from Titus. That's why I'm just calling them tidbits. I was going to call it tasty tidbits from Titus, but and which they are, but I just said t tidbits um, that are not found in First Timothy. Two of them, from one from chapter two and one from chapter three, are beautiful gospel-rich passages. Both of these sections are, are lessons for Christmas Eve. Um, in the in a Christmas Eve service, if you follow uh, the appointed lesson for Christmas Eve, there's a three year cycle and two of those years have Titus and then, and, and, and then uh, Titus two and then Titus three. And uh, in addition, chapter three verses four to seven is a reading for the Sunday the church commemorates the baptism of Jesus. That's in uh, usually in January, about the second Sunday or so in January. And the reason for this will become apparent as we look at these two passages. In the third section we'll look at, and if we don't have time for that today, that third section, um, we'll, we'll have time at the beginning of the class next time. So in the third section, Paul gives instructions about how to deal with a divisive person in the congregation, okay? So those three things he doesn't really talk about in 1 Timothy. So that's what we're gonna look at. The first section then, chapter two, if you get your Bible open to Titus, right after T Timothy, so first and second Timothy, and then first, uh, and then Titus, those are the, the, the so-called three pastoral letters of Paul 
the only ones that he wrote to people, except for Philemon, but that was different because that was a personal letter, but this is to people who were serving under, under Paul. Um, so chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. I'll, I'll read that section. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And then he closes it by saying, these then are the things you should teach, encourage and rebuke with all authority, and don't let anybody despise you. Again, that probably because he was young and that he wasn't, he wasn't the head honcho either that uh, Paul was, don't let, because he's coming with the word. He's coming with the word. Okay, that's a beautiful passage, and we're going to look a little bit at that. In your, now, in your study guide, down on the bottom of the first page, Paul starts off that section with, with the word for. And when by using the word for, Paul is telling us, he's giving us the reason why the older women, men and the older women and the younger men and the younger women, the reason why they should be following his instructions. He says, tell them to do this for, and now he gives the reason why. Motivation, okay, and here's the reason why. For the grace of God, that's at the bottom of the page there, the grace of God has appeared. And that is the Apostle Paul's Christmas story. The grace of God has appeared. And the Greek word there is the word that we get our word for epiphany, has an idea of a sudden appearance and uh, the grace of God has appeared. And that's, that's why this lesson, this, uh, lesson is, is appointed to be used on Christmas Eve. The grace of God has appeared. And there's, that's the motivation. Why do you want to do it? Not because you've got to, but because God has already done something so great for you. His grace has appeared. Now I'm on the top of the next page. Just a little paragraph there on top of page two. The verb used here for appeared, from which we get our English word epiphany, was used for the appearing or the rising of the sun. The rising sun will come from heaven. That's what Zechariah said in his hymn, the hymn of Zechariah, uh, when uh, the angel announced that, that he would have, a, that uh, his wife was going to have a child, and then the child was born, and then Zechariah uh, broke out in this song of praise. He says, the, eight, the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death. And you, and you think of Isaiah's prophecy, and I have it down there, Isaiah 9, 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. In, on those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned, okay? And now think of Luke's account of the first Christmas. Luke chapter two. Shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and lo, the angel of the Lord came, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. They were in the darkness of night, and all of a sudden, the bright light of God's appearance occurred. So, the... Uh, grace of God had appeared. And then Paul says exactly what happened when the grace of God appeared. He says this rising sun, this grace of God appeared and brings salvation, brings salvation. The NIV here, translation probably isn't quite as good and the NIV 11 says that offers salvation. It's almost like take it or leave it. And, uh, that, but that, the word really means it brings salvation. You can reject it, but it brings it. Uh, the grace of God that uh, appears that, ha that brings salvation. And all we have to do is think of the angel's message. 
To you this day is born in the city of David, what? A Savior, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. When I, when I read these words, I, I always think of our children's Christmas services, especially the little ones. And often they'll have that verse, to, they will recite it all out of the group, and, and they'll say it with such enthusiasm. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you with a big smile on their, on their face because they are announcing the good news. Okay? And that's what, that's what happened. Okay? The grace of God appeared, bringing salvation. And then the one last question there, for whom does this rising sun do this, bring salvation? He brings salvation to what? All people. Okay, all people. That doesn't mean everybody's going to go to heaven. But it means that Christ's death on the cross, his life and death was sufficient for everybody, for every single person. You can reject it. You can turn it down. But it doesn't mean that he has not saved them. And then the next word is sort of an interesting thing when he says, the grace of God, verse 12, teaches us. Normally, you don't think of grace teaching. Grace is an action of God. But the Greek word that is translated as, as teach uh, has the idea of doing something that a parent does for, for a child. A, a parent's uh, uh, effect on a child is a lot more than just what they say, right? When you, you think back in your own life and you think back to what your parents, what do you owe to your parents? Not, not just what they told you, but what they modeled in, in, the, course of their, in the course of their life. And that's, that seems to be what Paul is talking about here. God's word, God's grace teaches us. It influences us. It trains us. It molds us. It shapes us. It makes us different people. The grace of God makes us, makes, uh, makes us different people. And people who what? Say no to worldly, pa ungod to ungodliness and worldly passions. And that, that may be even from the time of one's baptism especially in the early church, most baptisms were adult baptisms because they hadn't been baptized yet. And what was a part, a big part of the baptismal ceremony is that the person would publicly say, I renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways. I'm saying no to, no to Satan, okay? And, and the grace of God has made it possible for him to do that. Otherwise, he's been saying what? Yes to Satan, okay? So that it teaches us to, to say no to ungodliness and people who live, and then he uses three words. I think most translations say self-controlled. I would probably rather say sober-minded. Sober-minded, it's a word that is uh, uh, sober-mindedness or uh, you think before you act. Uh, and uh, you, you, you don't let your emotions control you. You control your emotions and, and the like. So that, so the, and that we become sober-minded, upright, and godly. That we live sober-minded, upright, and godly lives. So we turn away from what? Ungodliness and wickedness. We turn toward this. We turn toward this as a result of the grace of God in our lives. Uh, and then he says, God's grace teaches us it shapes us, shapes us throughout our lives, and he specifically says, in this present age. Okay? If he says, if he talks about a present age, what do you think he's implying? What's going to come after that? A future age. Yeah, yeah, a future age. So uh, it, it, it has an effect. The grace of God has a great effect on us right now in this life. In the, in, the present, in, the, in the present age, he says. And, and then, um, all the while, all the while, we wait in hope for the second coming of Christ, and there that same word appearance is found. So the grace of God appeared, and the grace of God is going to appear. Okay? Only when it comes the next time, 
it's not going to be the God of grace so much as the God of glory. Um, you, you think of uh, what Jesus said when the Son of Man comes with all, his, with all the holy angels and all the glory. Uh, and uh, in, in this life, we see only glimpses. You look in the, in the Gospels, only glimpses of the glory of Christ. Can you think of some examples? Glimpses of the glory of Christ. That he's more than just a man. The transfiguration. Okay, so that's where they actually saw, saw his whole person, persona uh, transfigured, changed right in front of them, shown with all the glory of God. Anything else? His miracles. Miracles. Uh, with a, sure, all of the, any miracle that goes beyond what any human being can do. Christ's enemies said, what are we going to do about him? He's done these things and we can't, we can't deny it even though we don't want to embrace him, but he's doing something no human being can do. Well, and what was the greatest miracle? Resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection. So in this life, we see glimpses of the glory of Christ. And when Christ again comes again, we'll see him what? In all of us, in all of his glory. So in a, in a certain sense, we can also say, if you use the word grace and glory, in this life we live in the kingdom of grace, and in the life to come we live in the kingdom of glory, the glory covered fully with the glory of uh, the glory of Christ. And I, I just think of uh, the uh, uh, have the last last few weeks had Janice and I've had a chance to uh, visit. Uh, uh, Greta, not all of you know her, but Greta Lessing, who uh, that's a wonderful Christian Christian woman, and uh, who uh, went downhill physically pretty fast in the last few weeks. We visited her two weeks ago. We could have a conversation with her. When and one week ago, one week ago, we still could have a conversation, but sort of one-sided. She tried to talk, but we couldn't hear her. And uh, but she still could say thank you for coming. Wednesday we visited, she couldn't talk at all. I th she probably was in a coma at, at that time. And uh, what was she waiting for? The kingdom of glory. And she was ready, and she was, she was ready for that. Um, and uh, not all of you know, knew her, but she, uh, Greta, uh, lived right across the street from the church, and every Monday morning she had her own job. She was over here in church, went through all the pews, straightened out all the hymnals, took all the junk out that uh, people put things in Kleenexes or anything else like that, and cleaned it all, straightened everything out so it's all ready again for the next Sunday. And before that, for many years, she very faithfully uh, lived with and assisted her husband, Walter, who had had a severe stroke, uh, and a very quiet, unassuming uh, child, child of God. Now she's with the, in the kingdom of glory. So that's a, just a tremendous blessing. And then one last thing here, and Paul doesn't argue the point. He just says, we wait for the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So look at the title that is given to Jesus. Who is he? Not just man, but God. Our, and that's so important because if he weren't God, what couldn't he be? Our Savior. Our Savior. He couldn't be our Savior. He couldn't have risen from the dead. Um, his life, his perfect life, couldn't have counted for the world. His death couldn't have counted for the world. But he's our great God and Savior. Is Jesus God? If you ever had a, a, a Jehovah's Witness come to your door, they don't do that anymore now. It's one of the blessings of COVID. I, 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 and that, uh, they, but they, but they get into arguments and sometimes and take you to John chapter one verse one, and say this is what it says there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And they say all the translations are wrong, because it, all translations say and the Word was God, capital G. And they say oh no, that's supposed to be the Word was a God, small G. Not really God, but that's terrible Greek scholarship, uh, and uh, the, the word really means God. The word was and is, and is God. Okay, then one more thing on verse 14. 
on the paragraph you see at the bottom of your page there. Paul began this section, which, which is one long, beautiful sentence in the Greek, by taking us back to the first appearance of Christ, to his incarnation. Through his work, Christ would bring salvation to all people. The grace of God, centering in Christ's finished work, would have a dramatic effect on those attained by it. It would reshape their lives in this present age. Lives marked by self-serving ungodliness would be transformed into lives of self-giving godliness. And that's what the grace of God does for, does for people. Then Paul took us to Christ's second appearance, his appearance of glory, when he will gather in his elect and the present age will end and the new eternal age begin. And then in verse 14, what Paul does is sort of circle back to the age in which we are still living. Okay, and that's on the top of the uh, top of the page. He sort of summarizes that. Why did Christ give himself? Christ, first of all, gave himself. John 10, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Think of an example that would prove that. I'll give you a hint. Gethsemane. They all fall flat on their back. Yeah, and they're basically saying, you couldn't take me if I was not giving my life to you, giving my life. So, and, uh, so he gave himself for us, and then he summarized it again, and notice again that from and for, he, to redeem us from wickedness, to get us removed from wickedness, but not to leave a vacuum. By, and to purify for himself a people who are eager to do what, what is good. And with that, he closes off that section. That's just a, that's a beautiful passage. You notice he, he starts with instruction. Different age groups are supposed to do this and that. And, he, and then he says, let me tell you why. Think of what Christ has done for you. Okay, That's the motivation. All right, two further thoughts, questions for further thought. Some Bible scholars say that the all of verse, of, of verse 11, that he came to bring salvation to all people, doesn't mean all, but rather all classes of people, you know, like old people, young people, and, and, and the like. How would you respond to that? He came to bring salvation to all people. Some say, well, it, just, it means all classes of people. Well, okay, and that would be the bad thing if I didn't know. And, and the fact of the matter is, what does all mean? <laughs> yeah, it means all. And, uh, yes, go ahead. And isn't it found in multiple places in Scripture as well? So it's not just one spot. Yeah, all, all of the people of all of the classes. Is that... Is, It's the same type of thing. And could you say all kinds of people? Sure, but that, does, that only means all people but every, and every different kind of people, yeah. So he wants all people. By the way, a few translations, and here I don't usually have much to say in a negative way about the King James Version, but this one here, the King James and the old NIV, I think do a little disservice. Both the King James and the old NIV says something like this. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. When the Greek really is the grace of God that brings salvation to all people has occurred, has, has happened, has appeared. You see the difference? The one is, doesn't say that it's bringing salvation to all people. It's just that it's appeared to all people. And uh, the Greek, really, the grace of God that brings salvation to all people has appeared. Has appeared. Okay. Then, number two. The hymn writer, thinking of God's grace that has brought him salvation, responds, How could I refuse to shun every sinful pleasure since for me God's only Son suffered without measure? How do those two relate to each other? 
or another way, what's the relationship between faith and works? It's always a response. Works is the response. I, the works are not what make God happy with me. What makes God happy with me is what Jesus has done. And then my response, God is pleased with that, but not because I'm trying to earn something. It's always the response, the response to God, God's grace. Okay, anything further on that? Verses 11 to 14. Well, if not, then we're going to move into chapter 3. Uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 4 through 8. I'm, I'm going to start maybe with uh, verse 3. And chapter 3, verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. That's all the before Christ picture. Okay? But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, there's that same word again, appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. I'll just stop with that. Okay. This is a trustworthy saying. Remember we've talked about that in the last several weeks. There's five of those trustworthy sayings in the pastoral epistles. First one, this is a trustworthy from, from 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a trustworthy saying. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Sinners of whom I am chief. Number one, of whom I am the worst. Chief of sinners, though I be, Jesus shed his blood for me, okay? First Timothy chapter three, verse one. If anyone sets his heart on being, and the word Greek word is like an overseer or spiritual, spiritual leader, he, uh, he has set his heart on a noble task, okay? A noble task, a noble task of the ministry, okay? That's first Timothy three. 1 Timothy 4, verses 8 and 9. Bodily exercise is profitable for a little, but godliness is profitable for everything. So spirit, my spiritual well-being is more important than my physical well-being. That's really what he's talking about. And that doesn't mean, he, he does, he's not saying bodily exercise doesn't profit. He says, but compared to keeping our soul close to God, it profits only a little. No matter, the, the, the best well-trained person, I, I, I think I mentioned that when we had that, when that passage. I remember years years ago seeing that crazy picture of uh, uh, Jack LaLanne uh, pulling a big boat when he was like 80 some years old, and he's in there swimming and pulling that, but he was, a, he was, a, he was a, actually the picture of physical fitness. But where's Jack LaLanne right now? I don't know, I don't mean heaven or hell, but he's not alive, right? Because we all die. One day, one day we all die. Okay, then, uh, one more, Second Timothy chapter two. Is that chapter two, I guess it is, yeah. And that is, uh, uh, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God's grace overrides everything. That God is a gracious God. And now this is the fifth, the fifth one. This is actually probably the fourth one written because the second Timothy would have been in the last, the last one. All right. And then verse four. 
In verse, in, uh, right in the middle of the page in your notes here, in verse three, Paul lists seven characteristics of unbelievers, and we, we just looked at those, uh, and says that at one time, when we were without Christ, we too were like that. He says at one time we were all like that because we, what did, we deserved what? God's condemnation. Because we, were, we weren't any different than the rest of the ungodly world, okay? Because we were unbelievers, okay? We were unbelievers. Then, but, and that little one little word in the Greek, it's just two letters, de. But, ah, what happened? The kindness and love of God our Savior appeared. Paul's Christmas story number two. Same thing, right? The kindness and love the Greek word for love there is a group, the word that we get, our English word, philanthropy. Philanthropy, love for mankind. Okay? And God was the ultimate philanthropist. Uh, his love for mankind appeared. And uh, how did that happen? Well, obviously through the, through, the coming, through the coming of Christ and then what Christ's work meant. Uh, and, that, and that, that Greek word, by the way, same word, appeared. Same word as in the previous chapter from Epiphany, a sudden appearance. It was dark and it's light, yes. So is this uh, appearance, the uh, goodness and loving kindness of God appeared? Is that referencing the Christmas story? Is that referencing the individual's baptism? Because it seems like this is all like uh, talking about how you used to be one way, now you're another. Yeah, I think though what it starts off with is that it has to do with through Jesus Christ. So God's kindness is here, but then how did he, God saved us when his kindness appeared? How? Through our baptism then. I don't know if I'm making sense. He saved us through our baptism, but he saved us through our baptism because the kindness and uh, love of God had appeared. Yeah, okay? Then, uh, in the next verses, verses five and six, Paul tells us what happened because of the kindness and love of God appearing and why it happened and how it happened. So first of all, what happened? God saved us. The kindness and love of God appeared and God saved us. The Greek word rescued us. We were lost, drowning, Right, made alive. We were living in darkness, we were brought to light. We were dead, we were made alive. Okay, why did God do this? Not because of righteous things that we had done. He didn't look down and say, well, so-and-so, they, you've tried hard, so I'll save you, but I'm not gonna save you, you didn't make enough effort. He saved us, so that's it. He simply rested because of what? His mercy. Not because of righteous things that we had done, and now we get into what Nick talked about here. How did he save us? Here he's not talking about so much Christ's work, and I think you're saying it. He's not talking about Christ's work, but the result of Christ's work for us. The means of grace. How did God take what Christ did on the cross and the empty tomb when he said it is finished and rose from the grave? How did he take the benefits of that and apply them to our lives? It's called the means of grace. The way he does, the way God channels his forgiveness and life to us. One is through the word. Here he's talking especially about baptism. Maybe baptism, uh, the, uh, how he did it. Through our baptism. And Paul describes our baptism in two ways. And they are sort of parallel ways. A washing of rebirth. So you're born dead and you are made alive, okay? And a washing of renewal. You've made, been made brand new persons. And then he says by the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit, working, working in our heart. So that's the beauty, the beauty of our baptism. And uh, notice he doesn't say baptism represents the work that God does. Baptism actually doesn't. God saved us through our baptism. Uh, baptism, the washing of rebirth and renewal. And the washing, you can picture the, uh, it doesn't, the amount of water doesn't matter. 
But the, uh, in some of the ancient churches, uh, when we, I led a tour one time uh, to uh, following a little bit of the, in, into, uh, into Germany of the Reformation, but we were down in Italy to be, uh, begin with also. And uh, uh, we went into one, uh, one of the churches was in Pisa, uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and they had a, one area was the uh, main, one big building was the baptistry. And there, when you were baptized in Pisa, you were dunked, uh, and you went all the way underneath. And the mount, though, doesn't count, but it's sort of a very picturesque. Even Luther one time said, I like, I like baptism by immersion. But he wasn't going to say that you have to do it because some were insisting you had to. And, but a baptism by immersion pictures what really happens, doesn't it? You drown. A new person comes, a new person comes, comes alive. Um, and then in verses seven and eight, two purposes of our baptism. One is for the future and the other is for the present. First of all, for the future. Justified through baptism by God's grace, we become heirs. An heir is what? In the family, right? He's part of the family, and, uh, and, and what, what our inheritance is, not silver and gold, but the great glories of heaven, okay? We become heirs with the hope, and remember what hope means? Certainty. You just don't have it in your hand yet, but with a certainty of eternal life. So, so that's looking ahead, but then, just as in that other passage, there's another purpose of our baptism, moves us uh, to devote ourselves to doing what is good. If you look at verse eight, look at verse eight. Uh, this is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These are excellent and profitable for everything. So in other words, our baptism also has a purpose for this life, that we might live, come up, we, we're drowned, we come alive, and we serve God in, a new, in, newness, in newness of life. That's our baptism. And, then, and uh, I have a passage here from Romans. We were buried with Christ through baptism into death. In other words, we shared in the benefits of Christ's death in our baptism. Christ died on the cross. Here the picture is being drowned in baptism, our old self, the self. Uh, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a good life. So always saved from, saved for. All the, all the time that happens. Okay, anything further on that? Yes? Because it's, it's, it's something beyond, beyond human reasoning, okay? Really, and that's a simple thing, because you can do the same thing with the Lord's Supper. How can you say that you received the body and blood of Jesus? That's just bread and wine. I could, it tastes like I'd see it. And, uh, but then you ask, well, what does Jesus say? Uh, okay, same thing with baptism. And, and Martin Luther even asked that question in, in, in his small catechism. How can water do such great things? And, uh, uh, and, and uh, in fact, I think I, let's see if I can find that. Yeah, how can water do such great things? Okay, it is certainly not the water that does such things. And it's not just a handful of water, but God's word that is in and with the water and faith, which trusts this word used with the water, faith. But if you don't believe it, you read 
You don't get the benefit. You reject it. You reject it. For without God's word, the water is just plain water, not baptism. But with this word, it is baptism. That is a gracious water of life and a watching of rebirth by the Holy Spirit. And that long answer of Luther is based on Ephesians 5 verse 26, which describes baptism as a washing of water in connection with the word. It's the word that's there and you believe what God, what, what God says. And, I, and I'll say one other thing about baptism too. Baptism saves us, but it doesn't mean that every baptized person is gonna go to heaven. And confirmation means nothing except for it's a public confession of faith. There's no promise connected with confirmation of God. You make a promise, okay? But baptism, God promises, you are mine, but what can I do? I can just volunteer to walk away. And God doesn't want that. So there, there are going to be baptized people in hell. That's a sad thing to say. But if they are if they simply have rejected their baptism and the benefits and, and have nothing to further to do with the word all their life, they'll starve themselves spiritually. Yeah. Okay. And then the contrast to that, though, too, any baptism that is done, even though they believe it's a representation, is still a valid baptism. Uh, maybe not. I don't know if it is a valid baptism, or, or yeah, yeah, because they use the name of the triune God, I suppose, yeah, the name of the triune God, so that it is a valid baptism there. If I go back to it and say through that, through the, the only question that I have on that, and it's, it's a, 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 where, where you have to really wonder and want to be safe is if, if somebody is baptized in a, in a church that officially denies the triune God, in their teachings, but they maybe use the same words. And, uh, but it's not just syllables, it's really what the intent of the word is. If, and if, if so, an example would be Jehovah's Witnesses who do not deny the Trinity, they might baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If somebody came here, I'd say, I want to baptize you, just to be, just to be safe. But otherwise, yes. Otherwise, yes, they are baptized. It, it is a valid baptism. Okay. Anything else on that? Yes, Bob. There'll be people in heaven who haven't been baptized. Oh, and there'll be people in heaven who haven't been. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The people in heaven who haven't been baptized, unless they have rejected baptism and say, we don't want anything to do with it, we don't believe it, but then they're not believers. Yeah, but you're, you're absolutely correct. There will be people in heaven who have not been baptized, but they, they would not reject, it, reject the, the blessing of baptism. Maybe they don't know about it, or maybe they don't have time. You, uh, someone is a, is a deathbed conversion, and the person confesses faith in Jesus as Savior, and that person's in heaven. Yeah. The thief on the cross. The thief on the cross would be an example, yeah. He had no time to be baptized, but Jesus said, and today you'll be with me in paradise, yeah. So there will be people both both ways, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, Dave. You definitely see Luther working his way through this and the phrase, this is a trustworthy saying, resonating with him and becoming his. This is most certain. Yeah, it is a trustworthy saying, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, whether you whether you can, it, it, I'm oversimplifying in a way when I say that False doctrine comes uh, when in, in doctrines where it goes beyond human reason, and, but almost always that's the case. Because then, then it's a matter of, am I gonna accept what God says, even though I can't fathom it out, or am I going to have to fit it within the dimensions of my brain? And if I have to fit it in within the dimension of my brain, then I've made myself God. Because I, I think that I think God can know no more than I do, and, and then I, I put myself put myself above, or at least equal, at least equal to God. All right, um, I had. Let me go back up here. Note how in verses five and six, Paul portrays the Triune God at work in our baptism. It's sort of an interesting thing. Go to verse five. 
He saved us. He is God the Father. He saved us not because of righteous things that we have done. He saved us because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit carries out and, and whom he, that is the Spirit, poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ. So you see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are involved in our baptism. God really wants us to himself for himself as his family. And the triune God is at work in our, in our baptism. Um, you know, I think that it's seven minutes after, and uh, I think I'm going to leave this last section dealing with a divisive person because there's a lot we can think about there um, and uh, I, we'd have to rush so fast to get that done. I think we'll start that next week uh, and then we'll do a brief, I want to do a brief preview of what to expect in the study of Revelation. Um, and uh, even if you aren't going to be able to come on Wednesdays, uh, it'll still be good for you because it really talks about how to deal with that, how to read that kind of literature in in the Bible. And uh, we'll, we, I think we can probably get both of those done. But if we can't, we have to quit because I'm done here as of, uh, well, I can pick up, if I can't finish the Revelation pre preview, I'll do it the Wednesday when we get going. So we'll work it out in one way or the other. All right. Anything further? This gives us a chance. So church is down below today. Okay? Let us, let us uh, close. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.